Welcome to Being a Successful Leader with Carl Welty. Carl is a leadership pioneer with years of challenging leadership and consulting experience. Here's Carl with some valuable insights, practical and proven methods for being a successful leader. Greetings, Carl Welty here, your host for the podcast, Being a Successful Leader. Uh, we have 26 episodes that revolve around what I consider three imperatives of successful leadership. The first is being a skillful self-aware leader. The second is formulating and executing a sound strategy. And the third imperative is building a culture of commitment. Skillful self-aware leader, sound strategy, and culture of uh, commitment. We have 26 weekly episodes, and uh, they uh, run from 15 to 30 minutes each, again, revolving around these three areas of focus. Uh, today, the uh, we begin the third imperative, the first episode in that. And uh, the episode we have is building or having the business case or making the business case for building a culture of commitment. It's not just a nicety. It's a, it's a must, and there's good business reasons for doing so. And we're going to review those uh, today in this episode. You're, you're strongly encouraged to visit my website, wealthy.com. And in there, if you go over to Leadership Resources, you can catch up with any of the past episodes just by going down to the icon, clicking on that, and it puts you right in touch with whatever episode or episodes you care to uh, review or, or to uh, hear for the first time. Also, you find my books there and the book that relates directly to what we're talking about in this third uh, uh, area of emphasis is the uh, building commitment. And again, it's, it makes a dynamite package uh, to talk about it, but also to go back and have this as an ongoing reference, this book, and uh, you'll get a lot more detail and gra charts, graphs, tools, and things of that nature. So uh, uh, grab a copy of that, and uh, it's a good move. Uh, let's first, before we get into the business case for the uh, building commitment, a culture commitment, uh, what we're talking about here is a, a culture commitment versus a, a culture compliance uh, a culture of commitment is one in which people are personally motivated to achieve uh, their the organizational uh, aspirations because uh, they align with that. Their shared aspirations, if you will, the individual aspirations and the and the organizational. And a lot of what this is all about in the uh, third imperative is to how to go about uh, aligning those, the personal and the organizational imperatives. A culture of commitment is uh, people want to perform. They're self motivated as contrasted with a culture of compliance, which they're forced to perform, external movement versus uh, uh, self-generation. We'll talk a lot more about that as we go along. But the big question for the organization is, uh, do you want to employ the whole person or just hire a pair of hands? And that's, uh, that's pivotal in terms of understanding the difference here between commitment and compliance. Okay, there may be a few instances where, you know, you just want a pair of hands, I guess, for short order duty or things of that nature, but the vast majority out there as leaders, I, I'm sure you better have the whole body and just, just instead of just a pair of hands. Okay, let's go on and talk about the business case for having a committed uh, uh, workforce. A committed, engaged workforce equals a productive workforce, and a productive workforce is critical to optimize your desired organization results. That makes sense. Um, now let's review some of the research here. Uh, there's a growing amount of research to back up uh, the intuition that you have and I have in your personal experience that it makes good sense to have a culture of commitment versus a culture of compliance. Uh, Jeff Pfeiffer out of Stanford in his book, The Human Equation, talks about the uh, impressive evidence we have in analysis and real-life examples that he collects uh, about the importance of having a good management practices. And he goes on to say that having such uh, organizational competence uh, can provide an order of a 30 to 50 percent uh, greater returns by having a, uh, a culture of uh, commitment. And additional research by Pfeiffer and his colleague down there at Stanford, Charles O'Reilly, in a book called Hidden Value, talks about uh, several conclusions they made by examining the organizations that have good human resource practices, if you will. Uh, they offer more than just a, a job. They provide a commitment, if you will, a, a, an area of commitment of of community, security, mutual trust, and respect. And that's a lot more than just coming on board and having a job. So they provide that community. A second uh, finding they, is that the, it's not just hiring the right people, the brightest, or or that sort of thing. It's it's developing them. 
It's developing them on an ongoing basis and not just assuming, hey, you got a real Cracker Jack here and get going with it. The third uh, finding is that the uh, importance of, as I mentioned already, the importance of aligning the personal values, the individual's personal values with that of the organization. We talk about core values back in an identity, and um, you, we, you hopefully uh, use that and, and have already tacked down your core values. And it's important to align those personal values as you go about selecting people and, and working with them and developing them. And another uh, finding is that the close supervision, constant monitoring and so forth and so on, strips away any hope of culture of commitment. It's one of compliance as you're looking over their shoulder and so forth. You need to do that. And we'll talk more about that as we go along in the early stages, as a person comes on board, it goes into a new position for you and you need to uh, be uh, close by and, uh, and have great performance coaching, which we'll talk about. But as they grow and mature, then you need to back off and still be available and provide general guidance and nurturing and, and, uh, and encouragement but you don't need that constant close supervision. So those are some key findings by those, uh, those researchers. Another one uh, that I think is important is uh, Patrick Lincioni, who's done some good work in writing books about um, this sort of thing. He has a book called The Advantage, Why Organizational Health Trumps Everything Else in Business. He makes the case, and I like this, about not organizations not only having to be smart, but healthy. Smart and healthy. What, what does he mean by that? Well, by being smart is that you uh, are really up and do a good job on your functional specialties, things like uh, operations and technology and finance and marketing and customer service, those sorts of things. But you also need to be really good at de developing a culture of commitment in terms of your, your human resource practices. And that's often neglected. And he says that there's a tremendous competitive advantage in having not only a smart but a healthy organization. Well, why don't more leaders do that then? And if you recall back when we talked about something called the principle of technical priority, which I, once I mentioned to you is that people have a natural tendency to do the technical work over management work and leadership. And the reason for that, mainly, there's other reasons, but the main, main reason is that it's hands-on work. It's more tangible. Uh, people, leaders feel more comfortable doing that kind of work. And there's more immediate feedback, and it's more concrete. The same applies to this phenomenon about uh, uh, not engaging more in human resource practices and, and and favoring more the functional specialty uh, concentrations again marketing and finance and that sort of thing because it's it's the human resource stuff is less concrete and you feel less comfortable about it it's more uh, intangible but uh, got to get over that and you got to work on that just as well as the smart things in your organization to be both healthy and smart and in doing so gives you a competitive advantage. So there's a significant and, and sad, if you will, workplace gap between uh, uh, having a real healthy organization and, and not quite being there. The Gallup people, you're familiar with the Gallup polls and so forth. They do polls on lots of different things. They have an annual poll about the state of the American workplace. And just listen through some of these. I'll mention five pieces of research in this annual survey. This is the 2022 survey. Um, 195 plus thousand U.S. employees surveyed uh, uh, in, the, uh, in their database. And um, the, uh, they find that only 33% of employees feel engaged at work. Wow. One out of three feel engaged at work. And then uh, in answering do you strongly agree statements, four other conclusions here are, are data points. 21% of employees strongly agree that their performance is managed the way that motivates them. Only 21% strongly agree that the way things that go motivates them. 22% strongly agree that they get clear direction from the organization. Now, of course, we've really hit that one hard in your strategic framework, and we're going to bring that down from the macro to the micro level as we go to the building commitment and, 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 and 
focus on your individual workers and teams and uh, align that with the over organizational sound strategy. 15% strongly agree that the leadership of the organization uh, makes them feel enthusiastic about the future. And 13% only agree, strongly agree that the leadership of the organization communicates effectively uh, with them and the rest of the organization. Wow. That's startling. That's not, that's not good. So a lot of, a lot of room there, uh, as I call it a significant and sad uh, workplace gap. And why the gap? Well, we mentioned the big one already about the uh, emphasis on the more tangible and, and immediate feedback and concrete uh, sorts of things. Uh, th there are some others. Uh, one is that organizational leaders just uh, uh, don't get the connection or if they do, they, they kind of deny it. Uh, and then uh, some of the others besides the, the uh, concreteness or lack of concreteness compared to the functional specialties is that uh, uh, leaders tend to uh, go for fads, the easy solution, the uh, easy to implement, uh, the fads. The fad. I had one fellow consultant always told his executives, you always go for the fad of the month. And that's basically true. Some simple sorts of things. And as we talked about in this series, you need deliberate application of proven practices over time and no, uh, you know, uh, knee-jerk, uh, easy solution kinds of things. And then there's this short-term thinking over long-term thinking, the immediate results, the quarterly returns, that sort of thing. And uh, and this stuff takes time and, and deliberate effort. It's no uh, uh, snap uh, solutions. Um, now, I want to emphasize, too, is that you as a leader, wherever you are in the organization, uh, whatever level, whatever department, or leadership as a whole for the organization or departments or regions or other organizational entities, you, you're you a game changer. You're really important, regardless of your role and level. Numerous study, studies uh, back this up, the importance of the what I call the local line leader or the immediate supervising manager in terms of uh, turnover in the organization and the degree of engagement that people have. They look towards you as the local line leader. Sometimes you may not think that way, but uh, you're the primary conduit of connecting your associates and your your entity there uh, with the balance of the organization. You translate for them, hopefully you translate for them and make it relevant. You're the voice and the echo of the organization as a whole. And that's a key role as you translate and make it meaningful for them in terms of the organizational direction as a whole. And so the number of people who choose to stay on or to opt to go uh, in their organization is a relationship with them and their supervising manager. So again, that sounds like a lot of burden, and it is, because you are important as that individual link, the individual linking pain between your group and the organization as a whole. If you're fortunate enough to be working in a healthy organization, as we described, one has good human resource practices as well as functional specialty practices, you're ahead of the game. You have a good running start. But regardless, uh, you know, if even if your organization is not there, again, as I mentioned, you are a key link pin and you at your own organizational level can do the sorts of things we've been describing in this series and make a huge difference for the people that uh, work with you and for you. So I recommend that you take that that role seriously and do the best job that you can and this series is designed of course to help you do that all right so that's enough for the business case and we're going to move next time to uh looking at uh the whole the whole idea of, of this uh culture of uh, uh compliance and the importance of uh, understanding uh motivation and how that uh, directly relates to of uh, a culture of compliance. So that's our next episode teed up for a week from now. In the meantime, you take care of yourself and we'll see you.